Well, it is good to be back with all of you. It has been a while since I've had the opportunity to preach. Many of you know that I was supposed to preach a couple weeks ago, but they ended up getting really sick, and uh, my whole family got really sick, and uh, now we're much better. And uh, I just want to say to Pastor Doug Melder of our Oakland campus, thank you so much, uh, man. He did such a great job, you know, filling in. In like 24 hours, he turned it around. So I just want to say thanks to Pastor Doug. And uh, don't you love the fact that we are in the Christmas season? We're in full swing now. You love it? Are you enjoying it? Are you? That's great. All right. You are. You are in. Let me ask you, are you preparing your hearts? for what it is that we are going to celebrate, that what it is that we are going to behold, we don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss that Christ is the center of this season, right? We don't want to miss it. And so I love the fact that we, at all of our campuses, wherever you're worshiping with us today, that we have been celebrating and getting ready for Christmas. I was just on Friday night at our city Christmas concerts. It was amazing to be a part of that at the Kelly Strayhorn Theater. It was just an amazing electric atmosphere, preparing our hearts for the season. And, and we're getting ready at our Wexford campus to, to have our Christmas concerts. And, and I know that Swickley Valley, they've, they're getting ready for, well, they've had their miracle on, on 34th or Beaver Street, I think is what they call it, right? So I love the fact that we're getting ready for the Christmas season. But all of this, all of this, you know, stuff that we have going on, if we're not careful, we could miss it, right? We could miss it. We could get so busy. So we're trying to slow us down a little bit to behold. We want to, we don't want to miss it. So that's what Pastor Scott last week, when he kicked off our Christmas series, he said, behold, and he helped us understand that when we see this in the scriptures, it means, look, don't miss this. And it's a surprise, like you don't want to miss it, and so we don't want to miss it this Christmas season, do we? And so he kicked us off, and he took a look at the genealogy of Christ in Matthew 1. And so he has this fascination with this genealogy. And so you can see that there's a rhythm to it, he said. And so we're picking out these 14 generations. So let me read for us Matthew 1.17. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations. And then from David to the deportation to Babylon, another 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, to the Christ child, 14 generations. You feel the rhythm, right? And so he kicked us off last week and he compared Abraham in the Old Testament book of Genesis with Joseph in Matthew 1 of the Christmas story. And he challenged all of us that we should be beholding this, don't miss this, that when God calls us, we should be obedient. When he says go, we should go. When he says stay, even when it's hard, we should stay and persevere through the circumstances that God might have us in. It was a great sermon to kick us off in the Christmas series. Always, as always, you can go online and you can pick up that that sermon. Um, So today, as we begin our our second part of this Behold series, I want us to turn in your Bibles uh, to 1 Samuel 16, where we're going to be studying in the second part of these 14 generations. And today we're going to be comparing two accounts of two different shepherds. Okay, how cool is this? That we're going to be taking a look at King David, but shepherd boy who turned King David. And then we're going to be looking at the shepherds of the Christmas story. So this week we want to behold, we don't want to miss King David. But before he was King David, he was just a shepherd boy. So 1 Samuel 16, we're going to see here that um, in 1 Samuel 16 verses 1, we're going to see that now there is a guy... His name is Samuel. He's a prophet. And God, there's this very famous behold statement in 1 Samuel 16 where there has been a king that's been rejected by God. His name was Saul. And now it needs to come time for the choosing of a new king. And so this word that we're going to see, behold, we could almost miss it if we weren't careful. Okay, And so we see now that God's going to choose a new king. He speaks to the prophet Samuel that you need to take your horn of oil and you need to go to Bethlehem and you need to meet the sons of Jesse. 
And so the sons of Jesse, they come before the prophet Samuel and they sort of parade in front of him. And immediately the scripture says in 1 Samuel 16 that his eyes and his attention was drawn to the oldest son. His name was Eliab. And the scriptures, you want to know why? It's because his appearance and his stature was, you know, it was better than all the rest. And so here we have Samuel. We, we get a glimpse into his thoughts. And he says, in, starting in verse 6 of, of 16, he says, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Because he looks a certain way. He's taller than all the rest and he's good looking, right? And so we see here in just a moment that Samuel's about to get reminded that God doesn't look at it this way. And so in verse 7, it says this, The Lord says, do not look on his appearance or on his height or on his stature because I've rejected him. Now, now let me just sort of stop right here. Do you remember like when you were in gym class in high school? All right? Do you remember this? And, and there was the, you know, the team captains. They split up. And the team captains are looking for the best person available. Well, that's exactly what's happening in this story. Okay? Samuel is looking for the best person available simply on good looks and height. And so he's, he's kind of God's team captain, and he's choosing here. But look what it says here. Samuel hears from the Lord that this, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so these sons, they, they come before Samuel, son after son, and none of them are chosen by God. And so what's he to do? And so it's this famous behold coming up that there's this little shepherd boy, one of the sons that you know, Jesse, the dad, doesn't even think is worthy enough to be in the lineup. He's like the kid in gym class that nobody wants on their team. And so in this moment, he, he, he comes in, and in the present, he says, Samuel says to Jesse, he says, are all your sons here? And, and Jesse says to him, there remains yet the youngest, here's the word, but behold, look, don't miss this, he's keeping the sheep. It's not exactly what we thought, right? Behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel then said to Jesse, we'll send and get him, for we're not even going to sit down until he comes here. It's that important because that word was used. Look, don't miss this, okay? So there's that word. Behold, don't miss this, Samuel. You're about to miss it because I'm about to choose and do something that's unlikely. I'm about to choose the least likely of all the sons here. I'm about to choose the person that nobody would think that could be used by God, and I'm going to go and pick him. So don't miss it, Samuel. And isn't it true that we do the same thing? I mean, isn't it true that we do the same thing here? We look at the outward appearance, don't we? I mean, and, and there are times if we're not careful, if we just constantly look on the surface of things and we look how people dress and we, you know, look at what they drive or whatever, that we would miss what's going on in here. We do the same thing as Samuel. So watch this. So, so David now is summoned from the field, and, and it says, I love this description. Now he was ruddy. Ruddy, that's not a word that we use, but he was, he was kind of rosy in the cheeks, and he had beautiful eyes. I'm not sure I would want to be described as ruddy and beautiful in the eyes. Well, I'm not, so I guess it wouldn't happen. Anyway, so, but handsome. He's handsome, so that's good. And the Lord said to Samuel, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the front of, in the midst of all his brothers and his dad. And the spirit of the Lord, watch this, rushed upon David from that day forward. Samuel rises up in this moment and he anoints David with his horn of oil. And everybody there would have known exactly what's going on in this moment. They knew what this meant, that David was being anointed as king. The insignificant, the overlooked, the dad didn't even think that he was worthy to be brought to the lineup, and God pulls a great reversal. 
And he tells Samuel, anoint him. This is the anointing that King Saul, who was rejected by God, he desired so much, but he didn't get it. And here's why. He was so full of himself. He, all he thought was about himself, King Saul. And David is quite the opposite here. Humble shepherd out in the fields, a person who walks under authority and does whatever, whatever his dad tells him to do. And he's not even respected enough by his own dad to be brought with all the other brothers. And so if you're taking notes today, wherever you are on all of our campuses, if you want to note something here, and I'm going to have us reminded of this throughout this entire sermon, here's the bottom line, here's what I want to lodge into our hearts and our minds today, that here it is, James 4, 6, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so what we see here is God opposes the obvious choice of Eliab here. You know, we look at him, we say, oh, that has to be him, but that's not what God does. The choice instead falls to David, this overlooked, you know, this, you know, regular, ordinary shepherd boy. He's the choice. He's the one who receives the anointing, this special grace of God on his life. And so the word Messiah that we often hear at this time of the year, you know that it means the anointed one, right? Right? It can be translated as that. But literally, the word here that's used to describe this is to smear with oil. The anointed one, to smear with oil. And so in this moment, this is something that I need you to behold. Look, don't miss this. That in this scripture, it's foreshadowing now that from the line of David, because of this moment being smeared with oil, anointed, that from the line of David will come the Messiah. And this is an amazing moment for us here. And it's clear from this point forward in the scriptures that the story of God is now going to be a story of the least likely hero, the underdog, if you will, because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And maybe you're here today and you feel like you're walking through life in what you would call obscurity. You feel like nobody's paying attention to you at your work. Maybe even in your own family, you feel like nobody's paying attention to you. You feel like you're just caught up in the monotony of life and you're just tending sheep. Well, friends, this story reminds us that if you feel like that, that God reserves special grace for you. So be encouraged by that today. But maybe you're here and you're the total opposite. Now, you wouldn't necessarily say that you're the total opposite because those that are pride-filled often don't recognize that they're filled with pride. But we all know these people in our lives, right? Right? You, you have them and maybe in your family, maybe this is you. We all know these people, you know. This is the type of person that feels that they're entitled. They feel like they deserve to be chosen on the team in gym class. Just because of the way that they look or how popular they are or, or whatever it is that they drive or the house that they live in, they, they feel that they're entitled to certain things and they want it now. And this is the type of person that kind of, they have everything that they could possibly want and they, they, they make sure that they tell everybody that that's the case. And they earned it on their back. It's their, their hard work that got them there. They deserve it. Well, friends, in this story, we sort of see that God opposes that kind of attitude. God opposes the proud because he looks at our hearts. He doesn't look at our bank accounts. He doesn't look at our houses. He doesn't look at what we drive. He doesn't look at our trophy cases or our positions. God looks at our hearts. That's what he's after. God wants to give grace to those who are humble of heart, and he wants to lift them up at that point. Now, I realize that that's two very extreme examples, but I believe that pride is something that we all struggle with. I know that I do in my own life. Here's what I believe, that pride is at the root of our sinful nature. You know, because we want to live life our way. And we don't want to have anybody tell us how we should live, especially God. You know, so I believe that all of us struggle with this on some level or another. I know that I do with my day-to-day -day interactions with my wife. You know, just today, 
You know, the day-to-day interactions with the pink life, my three daughters, you know, and my coworkers here at the church. And I constantly have to remind myself, and maybe you do as well, that the world doesn't revolve around me. But that's really hard to do, doesn't it? It's hard for us to admit that. The world doesn't revolve around me. And so as a result of my struggle with pride, whether it's a little bit or a whole lot, here's something that I've learned from the scriptures, and it's in your notes there, that there is an inevitability to us being humbled. There's inevitability. Whether I choose to do it or not, you see, if I humble myself or God is going to do it for me. Think about it this way. In Philippians 2, in the scriptures, we see that it is absolutely clear that there is going to be a day, regardless of whether we believe in him or not, there's going to be a day where we will all be humbled and we will all bend the knee to the Messiah, Jesus. In fact, we see it in Philippians 2 that every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is who he says he is. And this King Jesus is the one that we will be bowing down to. He's the one that we're going to behold, regardless if we believe in him or not. And now here's where the story gets exciting. From the lineage of David, as we turn the pages of Scripture now, here's what we see. From the time that David is smeared with oil, he's anointed as king. And then as the time as his people then are exiled to Babylon, as the pages of the scripture turn, see, now from the exile to Babylon, another 14 generations goes by until the Christ child comes. And watch how this king comes. Feel the rhythm now of humility in this story. Let's check it out. You probably know it. Because in this moment, we see the anointed one, coming in humility, and Linus is the one who has made it popular for us today. Anybody watching Charlie Brown Christmas, okay, as a part of our Advent, get preparing our hearts, right? Charlie Brown Christmas in this moment. See, he's the one who made it famous for us, and uh, he, you know, you probably have it memorized, and so let me read this another shepherd story to us. So it says this, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So get the picture. Completely dark outside, stars in the sky. Bah. That was, I was trying to be a sheep there. And an angel of the Lord appeared. Just like that. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. I would be as well. Think about that moment. You're chilling out there all by yourself, tending to the sheep, and then boom, all of this stuff starts happening around you. Talk about freaky. And so this is why the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, there's our word, behold, look, don't miss this, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, all the people of the world. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ, the Lord. And so this is a, we can't miss this in this moment. And the word that we translate into the English language as Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. And so what we have happening here in the book of Luke, written by a Jewish doctor, he's saying to all of us, hey, 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 don't miss this, friends. This is the one that we've been waiting for. This Christ child Here's the anointed one. And so we see Jesus, if we're not careful, we're going to miss it because he comes in humility. And so the first thing on your outline about Jesus' humility is that Jesus didn't come in royalty, like royalty, but he came in humility. See, when we think of royalty, when we think of maybe celebrities, when we think of this, we think of much, you know, paparazzi, and we think of, you know, you know pomp and ceremony in this way, right? Everybody would have been expecting that. But no, it says in Philippians 2 that Jesus made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself. 
And so we see that Jesus didn't come in royalty, but in humility. And if we're careful, we might not, we might not see it. The second thing is that Jesus wasn't anything special by human standards. I mean, think about it. In that moment, as he came, it wasn't anything special born in a feeding trough. And it says, if you do and you look at the prophecies about the Christ child, it says this in Isaiah 53, that he had no form or majesty that we should even look at him. You know, and, and no beauty that we should desire him. This is a nice way of saying he was not good looking. Think about that. From external, he didn't exactly look the part of what we would think would be Messiah or a king. You know, when we compare this moment to what happens then with Eliab, when Samuel sees Eliab and he, he's good looking and he's taller than all the rest, when we see Jesus in the scriptures and how he's described, he's not anything really special to look at, if you know what I mean. And then the third thing about Jesus' humility is that his humble birth, Jesus' birth experience, causes then the humble to go and seek him. See, th this is the moment here where the shepherds cannot miss this moment. This experience then prompts the shepherds to go and seek to see if this is all true. Because they couldn't have missed this moment. Oh my goodness. Think about it. Put yourself in this context. You're in the middle of nowhere, you're watching sheep, and you're, and you're just, you know, by yourself, all dark. And then boom, oh, oh, oh there's, a, there's an angel. You'd be freaking out. I know I, I'd be like diving under the sheep, don't hurt me, right? Think about this moment. And then all of a sudden, the glory, you know, shone around, bright lights. I mean, think about this. And then the angel, the host of angels come around in this moment. And they're singing glory to God in the highest, right? Think about this. You're a shepherd. You're freaking out. They couldn't have missed it. But they had a choice to make in this moment. They couldn't have missed that experience. But they had a choice to make. They could go to seek out the Christ child or they could just write it off that, man, it was a bad you know, turkey sandwich for lunch. So they could not have missed that moment. You know, think about the other characters in the Christmas story, the other people, the wise men, they could have not have missed that star in the sky. They could not have missed it. Think about Mary, right? She, I mean, she couldn't have missed it, obviously, right? She's giving birth. I, and, and Joseph, you know, who's there and he's a part of the, you know, he's in the delivery room, so to speak. He couldn't have missed it. But if we're not careful in this season, friends, we can miss it. See, I want to put it in this context for all of us. Think about it this way. This month, there will be billions of people around this world that miss it. In our city, Pittsburgh, and in your neighborhoods, Tens of thousands of people are going to miss it. And here's why. They've never heard the story. They may have never even heard the name Jesus. Think about it. I know that you think, oh, that's not possible in Western Pennsylvania. It is absolutely possible. See, even, even people who have been created by God for God they're separated from God because all of us are sinners. That they're going to miss it because they've never been told this story. You know, if many people have heard the story because of Charlie Brown, but they choose to ignore it because they think that it's all about everything else at this season. People who have been inside church walls possibly their whole life, but have never really bent the knee to Jesus, they're going to miss it unless something changes in us. And friends, God doesn't want us to miss it. I, as your pastor, I don't want you to miss it. And so let me tell you this story. You know, there, sometimes my wife, she'll get really irritated with me when we drive, okay? So I have the kids in the van, and, you know, Eric is in the passenger seat, and she doesn't really get irritated so much about how I'm driving. It's actually because I have a tendency sometimes when, when I see something when I'm driving... I'll like blurt out, oh, look, 
right? So I say, oh, girls, look. You know, so, so it might be, you know, this season, like I saw Christmas lights, the, you know, the other night. Oh, girls, look, Christmas lights. And saw a wild turkey one time. I mean, and so that was cool. Oh, girls, look, a wild turkey. You know, there's this, there this one time where we were camping and, and, and I said, oh, girls, look, a puma. <laughs> no, that, if you're a guest with us today or you weren't here last week, that won't make any sense. You have to go back and watch Pastor Scott's sermon. I've never seen a puma. Anyway, so there's these times where, where Erica, she, she gets irritated with me. And he, here's the reason why. It's because if I say, oh, girls, look, and point it out, there's one that maybe misses it. You know, especially our youngest, Ainsley. And, and then it just ruins the rest of the car ride because she's crying because she was left out of everything. And so Erica's like, why do you have to do that? Why, why can't you just keep it to yourself? And, I, and I'm like, well, I just don't want them to miss out on what I'm experiencing. I think deer are cool. So I want them to see the deer that I'm seeing. It's running across the street. I don't want anyone to miss out on what it is that I'm experiencing and that I'm seeing. And so, friends, I don't want you to miss out this season about this very specific principle of the shepherd and of the Christ child and of King David, the humble heart. And so just like last week, these points that we want to make in these sermons are going to be these behold statements. And so here we go on your outline. Look, behold, don't miss this. Humility when rightly understood, is not the absence of self, but it's more the presence of God in ourselves. So, you know, when, when you do something and you accomplish something, it's not like, oh, shucks, you know, no, it wasn't me. It was, you know, no, that's not it. Humility is actually, you know, when you're known for who you really are, weaknesses and strength. But for these purposes here today, it's, it's getting into the presence of God. That's what changes us from the inside out. And that's how we know who we really are when we get into his presence. See, this is what happened when David is out in the, the fields and he's just worshiping God as he's tending sheep. God is changing his heart. This is what happens to the shepherds in the Christmas story. When they get into the presence of the Christ child, they are changed. See, and that's what happens for us. See, humility is not thinking, think of it this way. Humility is not thinking less of myself. No, no, no. Humility is thinking of myself less. Think about it that way. See, if the characters of the Christmas story in this moment, if they don't have this type of humility, then they're not traveling hundreds of miles to give gifts to a baby king. And more importantly, they, they're not beholding and they, they miss it. So, you know, the humble of heart, I believe, will always find a way, regardless of the circumstances that are surrounding you, to get into the presence of God. So let me ask you this question about this behold. Are you regularly getting into the presence of God? Not just one hour a week at a church service. Are you regularly getting into the presence of God? That's the first behold. Second behold, look, don't miss this. We need to put ourselves, these are going to kind of, you know, build upon one another. We need to put ourselves into a position to have the spirit of Jesus rush into our lives, just like David. We constantly have to come and humble ourselves before this Jesus in our actions, in our speech, in our attitudes, in our relationships, in our everyday life. See, when we empty ourselves and we think of ourselves less and we begin to just pour ourselves out before God, what happens is Jesus begins to rush into us and his mission, his ways, the way that he thinks begins to then translate into the way that we think and our ways and the way that we go through life. And see, when we're extended the grace from God, that special grace that only God can give, when we give Jesus room and we put ourselves into that position, then we begin to extend that grace to others. So let me ask us this. Are you in a position where Jesus can rush into your life? And to do that, I'm reminded of the scriptures that says, 
He must increase and I must decrease. So are you in that position? Well, how do I do that, Kent? What, what, what do I do to get into that position? Well, this is your third behold. Look, don't miss this. The Spirit will rush in when we are fast. It's an acronym, fast, faithful, available, servant-hearted, and teachable. This is what we see in David, the shepherd boy. And when we look at his life in First and Second Samuel, you'll see the reason why God chooses him as king. You'll see it, okay? He's not perfect by any means. That's not the point of humility. The point of humility is this, to become fast, to become faithful, full of faith in God, being able to be persistent and have an incredible pursuit of who God is. He's incredibly available to God, whether it's a shepherd boy or whether it's as king. He's available for God to use him as God wants. Are we that way? He is servant-hearted as you study his life. You see that he wants to serve the people of his kingdom, and he wants to serve God most of all. And there are times where he blows it. He messes it up. And those are the times where he's very teachable, where he is allowing himself to be corrected by the people that God brings around him in that moment. He doesn't, you know, get out of here. I'm the king. No, no, no. He's very teachable. And this begins to allow the spirit of God continuing to rush into his life. And then when we look at the shepherds of the Christmas story, we see that they're also fast. Think about this. They're very faithful from the time of that experience to go seek out and discover the Christ child. You know, they're available in that moment. They're very, you know, teachable. Like, oh my goodness, that is an incredible moment. And I'm going to go see if this is very true. I'm going to go and seek it out. And it turns out that it is so true. And so the spirit of the Jesus baby king rushes into their lives. And so my question for all of us today is this. Are we fast? Are we fast? I've learned this from my mentor, Dave Buring. Are we fast? And so are we faithful in our pursuit of Jesus or do we just sort of get to it when it's convenient for us? You know, are we available to be used by God, counted on by God? Are we just sort of say, you know what, God, I'm only available one hour a week. I'll take it the rest from here. Are we servant hearted like Jesus models in his life? Or do we believe that everybody is in our life to serve us? Are we teachable when we make a mistake? Or do we think we know it all? And my opinion is the only way. And, and it's my way or the highway. Are we fast? Because here, here's the thing. I promise you, I can guarantee this. If you are fast and you practice being fast, meaning you're humbling yourself, that the Spirit of God will rush into your life every day that you do it. And so I, I want to end our time here today by doing something maybe a little bit different. I'm not sure the last time that, that we've done this here. I want to actually memorize this big idea for the day that comes from James 4, 6. And so at all of our campuses, wherever you're worshiping with us today, I want you to join in with me, and we're going to repeat this for a while. And so God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Say it with me. God opposes the proud, but gives grace. Let it get into your heart. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. One more time. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, Northway, this season, I want us to behold. I don't want us to miss out on what Jesus wants to do in our lives. I want us to be able to humble ourselves before this baby king so that we can be fast, faithful, available, servant-hearted, and teachable. And I promise when we do, the Spirit of God will rush into our lives. I'm going to pray for us here in the Wexford Sanctuary, and wherever you're worshiping with us today, your campus leader is going to take it from there.